where they strung up a man, who they say he murdered three. Strange things have happened there. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. If I were a two-headed giant, uh, which head would get to enjoy a cup of coffee first? How would I decide which head would brush their teeth while the other got the body ready for the day by consuming massive quantities of coffee? Uh, do folks with two heads ever get tired of having somebody right there all the time? Now I'm all confused by wondering about things like this. I'm not confused by where to get the best coffee in the universe. Well, for our planet, for sure. 4501 McPherson is home to the Organic Man Coffee Trike and the best cup of coffee on the earth. If you can't get there from wherever you're at, uh, go to organic <clears throat> excuse me organic man coffee trike dot shop consume and enjoy I was on trailer trash terrors a few weeks ago and uh, Vic Hermanson had asked me all the right questions and the show ran about two hours uh, he we talked about how I had absolutely no interest in ever doing a podcast and then how I had gotten talked into it and we talked about many things that we've both done podcasts on. We talked about strange things seen here in Laredo like the little girl and the creeper and the pale crawler. Vic said he was visiting friends in Baltimore about 10 years ago, and they went to see Bob's Sideshow. There he saw the Cap Dois. Uh, keep in mind, many, as in most, sideshow things are manufactured. They take a bit of this animal and they sew it onto that animal. Maybe a monkey top on a fish bottom. Then they charge folks money to walk into a dimly lit room and try to see a monster of some kind. Other times they rely on mirrors to give the illusion of somebody changing. Uh, usually a scantily clad female will turn into a gorilla or other kind of a beast which was actually some guy in a costume. Of course, the, the door of the cage would pop open and the creature would come running out, causing everybody to scream and run out of the room. Some of these sideshow critters were based on actual creatures, while a few were legitimate anomalies. They weren't all fakes. The Minnesota Iceman is still considered by many to have been an actual creature, once living and breathing. The Cap Dois was probably several creatures sewn together to make one, two-headed giant. Most of the photographs floating around today show a tall thing, a man with two heads which both look a bit too small for the rest of the body. Many have shiny necklaces on that cover the place where the sutures are, or should be. Seeing two heads on one body will take a person's attention away from the fact that the body looks a bit unusual, a bit manufactured. There are a few Cap Dois out there still on public display. Uh, just because these bodies were manufactured to make money doesn't mean the original creature didn't exist. There are dozens of reports from hundreds of years ago where sailors spotted and had interaction with giants, and a few of them 
were sporting two heads. As I dug through my book collection and searched the internet, I found the origins of the Cap Dois uh, being from either the Far East or way down south. The translation of the name appears to mean two heads in Malay, which uh, would mean that the creature is from the Far East. The Cap Dois on display in many sideshows was said to hail from Patagonia, which is nowhere near Malay. The folks living in Port Patagonia don't speak Malay either. Uh, they mostly speak Spanish or Portuguese. A few of the original inhabitants speak Mapudungan, which means language of the earth. How could a thing from Patagonia wind up with a Malay name? Simple. The folks running sideshows were not known for their research into stories that they spread. The Siamese twins were from China, not Siam. So a made-for-viewing giant was said to come from the far southern tip of South America and was given an Asian name. It sounds better than saying Dos Cabezas. A Cap Dois sounds French. Well, probably because it is. The French had a lot of influence in Malaysia. The first French to visit Malaysian Peninsula arrived in the second half of the 16th century. The name Patagonia has an intriguing origin. In 1520, the explorer Ferdinand Magellan named the southern tip of South America Patagonia. Uh, but where did this name come from? The term Patagonia originated from the book The Primalian, a fantasy novel of chivalry written by Garci Rodriguez de Montalvo under the original title Amidas of Gaul. Uh, it was published in 1512. In this book, the word Patagon was used to describe giants. The name was later given to the southern tip of South America. When Magellan was sailing off the coast of South America, he encountered giants living among the local natives. In some parts of the land, entire tribes stood eight to ten feet tall. Uh, there was one or more giants that were over eleven feet tall. Many of these giants had deformities. Their faces looked almost animal-like. Uh, their bodies were asymmetrical. Some had legs uh, that are far too long for the rest of their body, and others had arms that hung down to their knees. One commonality seemed to be that many of these giants had bigger-than-usual feet. A few were covered in hair. Uh, depending on who saw them, when, and where they were seen, the description ran in all directions. The commonality was these folks were well over the heads of the men that encountered them. Magellan's chronicler and traveling companion, Antonio Pagafetta, no, Pigafetta, uh, described one of these natives as being so tall they could only reach up to the level of his belt. Uh, Pigafetta also witnessed the Patagonian shock when he saw his own reflection in a steel mirror, supposedly, for the first time. Well, that's what they say anyway. Anyone looking into a still body of water would have seen their image looking back at them. Uh, maybe Pigafetta just thought this was what happened. Antonio Pigafetta was a Venetian scholar and explorer. He joined the Spanish expedition to the Spice Islands, led by Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan the world's first circumnavigation, and is best known for being the chronicler of the voyage. I read somewhere where some college student put in a paper that Magellan 
circumcised the world. <laughs> That's what he said. And he turned it into his professor. A Patagonia is a place associated in legends of giants and mysterious beings. Uh, there's the Patagonian shoeshine rat and the Patagonian bursting rabbit. What? You've never heard of these creatures? You must have never read Dr. Fegg's Encyclopedia of All World Knowledge, uh, formerly known as The Nasty Book, written by Terry Jones and Michael Palin of Monty Python fame. I had a copy way back when I was young. Uh, you can buy a copy today for $25 at, where else? Amazon.com. The copy I originally had was missing the cover because it had been ripped off by somebody. And, well, now I have a new copy. A Patagonia encompasses the southern section of the Andes Mountains and is governed by both Argentina and Chile. A Patagonia is bound by the Pacific Ocean on the west, the Atlantic Ocean to the east, and many small bodies of water that connect them, uh, such as the Straits of Magellan, the Beagle Channel, and the Drake Passage to the south. At the time of the Spanish arrival, Patagonia was inhabited by multi multiple indigenous tribes. In a small portion of the northwest region, people practiced agriculture, while in the remaining territory, most of the folks there were hunter-gatherers. Some of these hunters were looking for two-legged prey. These were cannibals, and uh, some of these eaters of men were giants. Long after old Chris brought horses and cattle to the Americas, the locals began riding them, uh, the horses, that is, and using them to herd the others, uh, the cattle. It's a good thing they didn't get those two mixed up. Can you imagine riding a cow and trying to chase a horse? Inconceivable! Inigo Montoya, speaking to Vicini, I don't think you know what that word means. It means not conceivable, as in unbelievable. And once in a while I tell people it means that they can't get pregnant. The intentions of the Spanish Empire had been to keep other European powers away from Patagonia. Chile and Argentina began to colonize the territory slowly over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. This process brought a decline of the indigenous population whose lives and habitation were disrupted while at the same time thousands of Europeans, Argentinians, Chileans, and a few other countries all began to settle in Patagonia. Human habitation of the region dates back thousands of years, with some early archaeological finds in the area dating to at least the 13th millennium B.C. Uh, that's uh, 15,000 years ago. Why a thousand is called a millennium, well, that's beyond me. The original inhabitants of Patagonia consisted mostly of the Tiwileche Indians, who are thought to have come from Tierra del Fuego, the land of fire. I like that name, Tierra del Fuego. It sounds kind of exciting, really. The most ancient artifacts, such as harpoons, were found in caves along the Straits of Magellan, suggesting that these people were moving up and down the mainland coast about 5,100 years ago. The tall, muscular Tiwileche were divided into northern and southern groups, which each had their own dialect. Spanish explorers found the Tiwileche living as nomadic hunters in Guanaco and Rehi. The surviving descendants of those people are few in number. Nearly all of them have been assimilated into the Spanish culture. 
Where did the folks living in South America come from? Well, the experts tell us they came from North America. Uh, they just kind of wandered on down south over the years, looking to see what was over the horizon. Where did the folks living in North America come from? You ask ten boys in white lab coats, and you'll get eleven different answers. Somebody's going to change their mind. That whole Bering Land Bridge theory, the bridge didn't get usable until around 12,600 years ago, according to those people. Human remains have been found in the Americas that date back around 15,000 years ago. Um. So if the land bridge wasn't usable until 12,600 years ago, where did all those human remains come from? They are sure most people in the Americas descended from the eastern Russia and from China. Uh, they might have sailed across the Bering Straits. After all, the Polynesians rode from China to New Zealand. The boys in the white lab coats still fall back on the old fossil record, saying they can't find any evidence. I can't find any evidence of intelligent humans in Washington. A lot of those people are scary. Any time somebody does find evidence, they dive on top of it, and then they hide it away in the basement of the Smithsonian. <laughs> And I'm getting off the subject. For unknown reasons, scientists hate talking about giants. In the late 1800s, when research, when research raiding parties swept across the western parts of the U.S., they were not looking for ancient artifacts. They were looking to cover up any and all evidence of Indian progress. From 1840 to 1877, a phrase was being used to justify kicking the locals off of their land in the name of progress. Manifest destiny. It was easier to say that the Indians didn't really own any of the land that they were being driven off of, if there was no proof of, say, buildings or huge monuments, uh, like, say, the Serpent Mound or those massive cliff dwellings found all over the West. The Smithsonian was established in 1855, and they sent out groups of men to seek out anything that might get in the way of manifest destiny and make it go away. December 3rd, 2014, the World News Daily Report published an article titled Smithsonian Administration, Destruction of Thousands of Giant Human Skeletons in the Early 1900s. In the article, the site reported that the Smithsonian Institution colluded with unspecified parties, probably politicians, to suppress information providing, approving the existence of giants, and the Supreme Court ruled in 2014 that documentation of the discovery was to be released in 2015. Yes, I know about the folks who jump up and down yelling fake news. Uh, just about all of these fact checkers are funded by the same group, the Ministry of Truth. In Giants on Record, Jim Vieira and Hugh Newman give hundreds of examples of people finding giant skeletons, only to have the evidence seized by a certain government establishment. I think that book is right there, behind me. The only reason the Cap d'Oie remains are still around is they say they're not real. Had they been, the Smithsonian would probably have them hidden away in the basement somewhere. The sideshow body is based on a real creature, as far as we know. 
Europeans were kind of short back in the 1500s, about 66 inches, which is about five and a half feet. Napoleon was five foot six. All that converting from feet to decimals and then back to feet uh, caused him to shrink down to five foot two. He was actually average size. It's just people like making fun of him because, well, he's dead and he can't defend himself. The Indians living in Patagonia were supposed to have been around six to six and a half feet tall. They say this is why the sailors call them giants. Well, I say nay, nay. My wife and I met Keith Crabtree in Jefferson, Texas one day. He stands about six foot two, maybe six foot three. I would say he's very tall, but he's not a giant. He played the beast in the legend of Boggy Creek. When the sailors ran into some of these Patagonians, they said these people were 10 to 11 feet tall. Uh, that is hard to excuse as just being really tall. That sounds like a giant to me. Folks say they were exaggerating to make themselves sound, I don't know, braver maybe? There I was, standing next to a guy that stood 11 feet tall. Uh, we were like best buds. I know people didn't talk like that back then. The way they did talk makes my head hurt. They probably didn't have that weird accent either. I've even talked to a few priests that have told me that the stories of giants in the Bible were just there to explain other things. Uh, I kind of felt like they didn't believe in the devil either. I thought long and hard about giants and why those in positions of power might want to pretend that they were just fairy tales. One possibility is there might be some DNA harvesting going on. The folks who actually run the planet want to build a giant army to keep us little, and that's not figurative, people in our place. This is the same group trying to build AI robots that can kill anyone not towing the line. Why have both, you might ask? We've heard the old saying about eggs and baskets. A huge AI army might be vulnerable to an electromagnetic pulse weapon. And not knowing for sure that your army would still be standing after a pulse weapon, a smart person, and those folks are smart, would have more than one way of controlling the planet that they believe is theirs. Next, you have people still way up there in our society who believe that all of those giants were demons or fallen angels. Demons, they say. These are all demons and they must be destroyed. I've heard this argument from several people. They usually get a glazed eye in their eye, a great glazed look in their eyes as they talk about all the things that they've heard while attending some religious gathering, usually led by some guy who pronounces Jesus as if it has three syllables. Next, you have the folks that built their careers by saying that giants weren't real. Anytime some evidence comes forward that could knock them off of their haughty position, they bring out all the resources at their disposal to keep these inconveniently tall folks hidden from the rest of us. There could also be some beings pulling the strings of those that we elect every so often, who are actually these tall folks. They keep themselves hidden, and any evidence of them is to be removed from public view. Too many people out there hold their breath waiting for somebody, either in a white lab coat or sitting on their TV set, to tell them when it's time to start breathing again. 
The Atlantic coast of Patagonia was first fully explored in 1520 by the Spanish expedition led by Ferdinand Magellan, who on his passage along the coast named many of its features, such as San Matias Gulf and Cape of 11,000 Virgins. I kid you not, that's what he called it. I wonder, where did he get that name? Were there 11,000 young ladies lined up on the shore waving waving to him and his crew? Or did he have a dream? Now, keep in mind, these guys were away from home for months, sometimes years. What did he see? I, I must, I'm going to have to look that up sometime. Magellan's fleet spent a difficult winter at what he named Puerto San Julian uh, before resuming their for voyage further south in August. Uh, during this time, they encountered the local inhabitants, likely the Tiweleche people, uh, described by his scribe Antonio Pigafetta as giants called Patagonians. Magellan managed to capture two male giants. Well, actually his men did the roping and the capturing as specimens to return to Europe, but they both died en route. Not wanting two dead giant bodies rotting under the hot sun and having no means of preserving them, both bodies were thrown overboard. Feed the sharks, I guess. Uh, these creatures were over ten feet tall. Many others, including Francis Drake, Pedro Sarmiento, uh, Tomé Hernández, Anthony Knivet, said that they had all seen giants while sailing along the Straits of Magellan. Sebolt de Wirt who lived from May 2nd, 1567 till May 30th, 1603, was a Dutch captain. He sailed across the Atlantic to have a look at this place that people were calling the New World. Most of what sat right across from Europe had already been mapped out, and so he set his sights on the southern portion. He sailed along the eastern coast of South America, which was called south america even back then 1507 amerigo vespucci had mapped out most of the coastline along the northern part and when maps were being drawn up well they put his name on everything a columbus got a town in ohio old chris wasn't considered much of a historical figure until the american revolution the Founding Fathers wanted to eliminate any claim that King George might have to the colonies. By telling the world that the New World was discovered by an Italian working for the Spanish, it removed England's historic claim. Why they didn't go with the Vikings? Well, none of the Founding Fathers were from Scandinavia. What were we talking about? Oh yes, Captain Sebalt de Wert and his exploration of the coast of South America. Also the Falkland Islands. He didn't do this alone, of course, but his name was the one that got written down. His crew were just there to do all the hard work. De Wert described an incident when he and his men the guys forgotten by history, were in boats rowing to an island in the Magellan Straits. De Wert had originally set sail with five ships. During their voyage, they ran into just about every problem that sailors could find. Men began dying from disease almost as soon as they were out of the harbor. Four ships got lost in storms. Their food went bad and their water ran short. De Wert ran into another group of explorers that were en route to Japan. Instead of joining them, which was probably a smart move, most of that crew died of disease as well. Well, De Wert had decided, at the prodding of his men, 
they threatened a mutiny, uh, to return to the Netherlands. Before attempting the long voyage home, they were going to stop at an island and get provisions. Anchoring in the straits, De Wert and some of his men rowed towards the shore. The Dutchmen said that they saw seven boats approaching from that island. These boats didn't look like anything that they'd ever seen before. What got everybody kind of excited, and in a bad way, was these boats were filled with giant naked men. The, gi the giants gave the Dutchmen angry, nasty looks as they rowed closer. They were armed with all manner of spears and things to hit people over the head with. These giants had long hair with reddish-brown skin, and they were very aggressive towards the crew. Well, the crew began shooting at the giants, and they managed to turn them back to the island. The giants began dragging trees out onto the beach, and they set up some kind of a defensive structure. The idea of even trying to land was inconceivable. There's that word again. De Wert had his men return to their ship, and they began looking for a less hostile island to land on. De Wert said the sightings of giants were not unusual in this region. His expedition was the only one to witness such aggressive behavior on the behalf of these giants. The last reported sighting of giants was at Cabo Virginius, in 1764 by Commander John Byron. The Patagonian giant reports died down substantially only a few years later. In 1773, John Hawksworth published on behalf of the Admiralty a compendium of noted English Southern Hemisphere explorers journals, including that of James Cook and John Byron. In this publication, drawn from their official logs, the people in Byron's expedition had encountered uh, clearly were no taller than six foot six inches, by no means giants. Interest soon subsided, although awareness of and belief in the concept persisted in some quarters even into the 20th century. Britain was trying to get people to move to the area and establish colonies. To me, the downsizing of the giants could have been to lessen people's fear in moving to this wild area of the globe. Greenland was named in order to get people to move there. It was a PR scam. Greenland is covered in ice. Iceland is more green. The Vikings settled in Iceland, and they named it Iceland, hoping that the name would discourage other European people from making their own settlements there. They named Greenland to achieve just the opposite effect. They wanted other countries to try settling on a giant iceberg. Britain wanted citizens to travel to Patagonia to establish colonies, so they told everybody, Oh no, there aren't any giant cannibals there, just some kind of really tall Indians. It's only a few hundred miles from Patagonia to the Falkland Islands. Where does the Cap d'Oie fit into all of this? Depending on who you ask, the creature is also called the Katwa, uh, with a C. Both are two-headed giants and are said to come from either Asia or South America. Uh, this creature is said to stand around 12 feet tall and weigh over a 1,000 pounds. Tales of this two-headed giant have been passed down through generations. One account says that the two-headed giant, Cap Dua, originated in Southeast Asia, primarily from the area around Indonesia. Despite its mysterious origins, this creature has been sighted in various locations throughout the area, 
including the Sunda Straits and the Malacca Straits. What sets this creature apart from other legendary creatures is its reported level of intelligence and its potential role as a guardian spirit. Reports suggest that it may be able to avoid ships and vessels due to its extreme intelligence, leading some to believe that it was sent by some higher power for protection of those living in the area. The legend of Cap Dois is one that has been passed down through generations for centuries. Storytellers have long recounted tales of this mysterious creature, ranging from sightings of it amid storms at sea to stories about it protecting sailors from danger. Depending on which version you hear, Cap Dois can take on many forms protector or predator, friend or foe guardian spirit or harbinger of destruction. Despite all these tales and legends surrounding Cap Dois' existence, there remains no concrete evidence of its existence today. Only stories told by those who claim to have encountered it in their travels. While some may consider this creature nothing more than a myth or old wives' tales, Others still hold out hope that one day they will uncover proof that this creature actually exists or existed. In many cases, the Cap Dois has four legs, each of which is reported to be extremely muscular and powerful enough to enable the creature to run great distances faster than a horse. Its long snout with sharp teeth gives it an intimidating appearance that could easily frighten off potential attackers. It has a mouth like a shark. The two-headed giant has several other distinguishing features which set it apart from other creatures in the animal kingdom. Its eyes are said to glow red when angered or excited and some reports claim that it can roar loud enough to cause buildings to tremble. It is covered with scales that are so tough that it will deflect arrows shot by any hunters. Some said it was even bulletproof. These creatures don't sound anything like what the European explorers were encountering in Patagonia. None of the records told of extra legs or scales or glowing eyes. They didn't tell of any paranormal abilities. The Patagonian giants were very tall, and few of them actually had two heads, and that was about it. The British sailed ships all over the planet. Some of them had the opinion that anyone who didn't speak their form of English was uneducated. Never mind that the Chinese had toilet paper way back when the Brits were still dumping their poo in the gutters. Chinese judges knew that a man could be identified by the shape of his ear or by his fingerprints. Now, this was back in 300 B.C. England got into fingerprinting in 1823. Ah, but they didn't speak proper English, so uh, they were not all that smart. Other parts of Asia fell under the sights of European merchants that wanted to take goods back to their homeland and sell at the biggest profits possible. Anything of interest was looked into, and one thing that they heard about was the Cap Dois. Uh, being a paranormal being, the merchants were never able to capture one. Spain did send ships to Asia. After all, they owned the Philippines. At least they thought they did. They competed with all the other countries trying to conquer and exploit the locals. I can hear the easily offended already. How dare they do such things? It wasn't the sole concept of Europeans. Every major country, and a few minor ones has conquered their neighbors and either enslaved them or sacrificed them to their gods. 
this was and still is a way of doing business. China tried to invade Japan. Mongolia, well, they invaded everybody. Japan, well, they tried to invade everybody. It's a, it's a way of life with a lot of people. It's not just the Europeans, but some people will try to pretend like it was. The American Indians were busy killing each other off long before the Europeans arrived and continued killing them off. Getting back to the show, Spain was finding that the East was a very hard place to do business. Just getting there and back was a major task. The Cape of Good Hope was hard on ships and men. You had to sail east past the end of Africa, do business in Asia, and then sail back past the Cape. Uh, this is what caused the legend of the Flying Dutchman to come about. South America was far easier, and seeing as they had put in colonies way back in the 1500s, uh, plus most of South America from Venezuela to Argentina spoke Spanish. Why do you suppose Brazil speaks Portuguese instead? Well, it has to do with the Pope back in 1494. After old Chris bumped into that island in the Bahamas that he thought was a part of India, a Spain and Portugal began competing to claim the entirety of the Americas. Spain sought support from the Pope, who just happened to be Spanish-born Alexander VI. He created a line of de demarcation to divide the nation's claims as part of the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494. The Spanish-born pope issued bulls setting up a line of demarcation from pole to pole, 100 leagues, which is about 320 miles, west of the Cape Verdes Islands. Portugal got everything east of the line, and Spain got everything to the west. So most of South America speaks Spain, uh, Spanish. Most of South America speaks Spanish. The two languages uh, sound a lot alike, but there are differences. Uh, Spain began doing to South America what Britain was doing to Asia. We want that, so we're going to take it. Sailors going back home to Europe would tell about seeing giants as tall as 12 feet. And the folks back home would say things like, you need to cut down on the booze, or stay out of the sun. It's having bad effects on your brain. Most people want others to believe them. It's human nature. After being told that they were just imagining things, or far worse, they were lying, a sailors began trying to capture one of these huge beings to take back home so they could rub their detractors' noses in it. A concerted effort was put forth to capture a giant and bring it to Europe, hopefully still alive. That way it wouldn't stink up the ship. Well, more than it already stunk. A picture this. They didn't bathe back then. There was no water to get cleaned up, so... Most of those sailors had kind of a pungent aroma. Anyway, getting back once again. In 1673, a ship full of Spaniards spotted not just a giant, but a 12-foot-tall giant with two heads. This was their ticket to the big time. Well, at least it was for the captain and the owner of their ship. Still, the men looked to gain financially if they could capture this thing and somehow get it home, in one piece. Using ropes and a lot of manpower, the Spaniards surrounded the giant and lassoed him. The giant was enormously strong, but, well, he was outnumbered. The men got him tied up and hauled on board their ship. The ship's hold was way too small to accommodate such a creature, so they tied it to the mainmast. The trip back to Spain was going to take some time, and, well, it was going to take a lot of time, and the ship only had so much supplies, 
even for the regular-sized men. At some point in their voyage, the giant was able to break free. Now they had a big-time problem. A ship at sea is kind of small, and that giant was kind of huge. The men had two choices, either fight the thing or jump overboard in the middle of the ocean. A fight ensued, and finally one of the men was managed to drive a spear through the monster's chest. The deck was littered with four dead men and numerous wounded. Now, with a dead body slowly decomposing, the captain decided to have the body cleaned up and try to preserve it by packing it with salt. The salt dried out the body and thus preserved it for the voyage home. This might not have been what they did. Nobody bothered to write down how they did it, only that they got the body back to Spain in fairly good shape. The body was quite a hit once people began seeing it and understanding that all those sailors had been telling the truth. Now, the body was in bad shape. It had been beat, it had been stabbed, and then it had spent several weeks laying on the deck of the ship. So it looked like you'd expect a dead body back when nobody knew how to taxidermy a giant. Instead, they had dried out the husk that kind of looked like a 12-foot-tall, two-headed giant. Uh, people would only pay their entrance fee so many times so the body would be moved from town to town. The people living in England heard about this extraordinary thing, and uh, they wanted to get in on it, too. Uh, people didn't travel very far unless they were either in the military or it was a part of their job. So, instead of people drive, uh, traveling to Spain to see the giant, they moved the giant from Spain to England. It wound up in what was called the Edwardian Horror Circus, which was managed to obtain the Patagonian giant. And that's what it was called at the time. Somebody seeing the two-headed giant must have said that this was the Cap Dois from Asia. Well, the name stuck, but the location was still South America. In the early 1900s, the now stuffed giant was purchased by Mr. Bartram, who toured the country, ending up in Weston Supermar in Somerset where the curiosity passed through several hands and was exhibited at various locations. The mummy eventually ended up at Weston's Brynbeck Pier in 1914. In the 1930s, two doctors and a radiologist inspected it, and they said they found no perceptual evidence of it being a fake. They speculated that it was some kind of conjoined twins. This could have been just a story created to make the Cap Dois more believable, or this might have been a real captured Patagonian giant with two heads. Visitors to Weston's Burnbeck Pier paid two pence, which is two pennies, to see the black giant laying on his back wearing a loincloth armed with a large club with a snake coiled up sitting on his chest. The exhibit is mentioned in an innkeeper's diary from 1931 by John Farthingill and in Cedar with Rosie, 1959, by Lori Lee. It was sold to a showman called Lord Thomas Howard in 1959, and at that time it left Weston. Let's go on another tangent here. That little round coin with nearly no value that some folks call a penny is not a penny. It is a one-cent coin. One percent of a dollar. A penny is a British coin that is worth one two hundred and fortieth of a British pound. The mummy moved around England for about forty-five years, 
It changed hand several times before ending up in Baltimore, Maryland, where it now resides in the collection of oddities known as Bob's Sideshow in the Antique Man Limited, owned by Robert Gerber and his wife. While many believe that the mummified remains of the Cap d'Oie are fabricated hoax, the truth behind this legend remains a mystery. Mr. Gerber tells a different story than the Spanish sailors capturing and then having to kill the giant while en route to their home port. He says the creature was found laying on a beach, already dead, with a spear still sticking from its chest. The folks who found it loaded into a wagon and transported the huge body to Paraguay. It might have been hauled by boat up the Rio Par Paraná. Paraguay is landlocked. There would be no way of transporting it in a ship, seeing as the river has huge falls in it. It had to go by wagon, perhaps at least around the uh, the falls, and then maybe they loaded it on a boat. It was in Paraguay one way or another, and the body wound up being mummified. A captain named George Bickle saw this huge giant, and he bought it. From there, the Cap d'Oie was shipped to England, not winding up in Spain. It was displayed all over the United Kingdom. When interest began to wane, the body was sold and then shipped to the United States winding up in Baltimore so that Vic could go see it ten years ago. He also got to see the Minnesota Iceman many years ago. I never got to see either one. Oh well, I did get to see that woman turn into a gorilla. The conflicting stories may simply be the product of natural promotion of such an oddity over so many years in sideshow displays. The Barker, the guy whose job it was to entice people to pay their fee so they could see something unbelievable, would sometimes come up with his own story as to when, where, and how the Cap d'Oie came to be on display. I miss the old days when you could find these sideshows all over the place. You'd pay your money, enter a darkened tent, and gaze at wonder at what usually amounted to a hoax. Or was it? It was your job to look at the thing and try and figure it out. I seldom managed to see these sights, but the few that I did have stuck with me. I wonder what the kids today talk about when they become my age. How they scored a million points on an Xbox game, or how they managed to stay in their parents' basement forever? What are they going to talk about? I can't imagine any cars on the streets today, the, the new ones, ever being shown in a museum somewhere. Not like the old cars from the 50s and the 60s that, oh, those things were beautiful. And cars today, they all look the same. The Paiute in Nevada have an oral tradition that they told the early white settlers of a race of red-haired white giants that their ancestors referred to as the Sitika. These giants were described as being vicious, unfriendly, and cannibals. After years of warfare among the tribes in the area, they decided to join forces in order to rid themselves of the Sitika. The tribes chased down the red-haired giants who took refuge in a cave. Piling brush up in front of the cave entrance, the Indians set this on fire. Uh, the blaze robbed the giants of oxygen. Any that tried to escape were turned into porcupines with as many arrows as could be fired. Once the battle was finished, the tribes avoided the cave, considering it to be cursed. In the 1800s, Guado miners began working the cave and they discovered several mummified bodies. Each was about eight to nine feet tall. They had red hair 
and a few of them had double rows of teeth. Where have we heard that term before? Archaeologists were sent for and the cave was excavated. In it they found sandals made for somebody with 16-inch feet. There were boxes of artifacts loaded onto trucks and driven away en route to the Smithsonian. When the locals began asking what happened to all those skeletons and artifacts, the Smithsonian said, What skeletons? What mummies? We never recovered any skeletons or mummies from a cave, and in fact, we've never even been in your town. All those witnesses who saw the trucks and the archaeologists, they were all mistaken. The Codex Borgia is a set of Aztec manuscripts made from the 1250 until about 1521. It has been studied for centuries and scholars continue to study this complex manuscript in order to better understand its original meaning and use. The Codex is almost like an ancient graphic novel. Uh, since the Aztecs used pictographs with writing to give explanation. Each page of the Codex is meticulously hand-drawn, showing scenes of life and death in ancient America. One illustration shows a group of soldiers fighting with a giant standing nearly twice their height. Annotations on the page give the giant's name as Quinmatsin, which translates as one of the old ones. Now, where have we heard of the old ones before? The Iroquois, Osage, Tuscaroros, Hurons, Omahas, and a lot of other Indian tribes speak of a giant men who once lived and roamed in the territories where their forefathers lived. There are well over a thousand accounts of seven to eight foot tall skeletons maybe hundreds of skeletons over ten feet tall. Newspaper accounts, town and county historians, letters, scientific journals, diaries, photos, and even Smithsonian ethnology reports have carefully been documented of these finds. Skeletons have been reported from coast to coast with strange anomalies such as double rows of teeth, jaw bones that were so large they could fit over a normal person's head, elongated skulls, and enormous height. Smithsonian scientists documented at least 17 skeletons that stood over 7 feet tall, including one that was 8 feet tall. They also told of a skull with 36-inch circumference, found in Anna, Illinois. The average human skull is 20 inches around. The skeleton reports no longer seem to exist for some unknown reason. The official story is that these skeletons have been returned to their tribes of their origin. The nasty little secret here is that the tribes have to prove that the skeletons is one of theirs. The Great Serpent Mound is 1,370 feet long. It's a prehistoric effigy mound located near Peebles, Ohio. While researching the mound, they discovered several giant skeletons. Due to there being no written record of who these giants were, the scientists could only guess. In 1890, Professor Frederick Ward Putnam excavated some of the mounds next to the Serpent Mound, and he said he found no six-foot-tall skeletons. Well, there's a postcard that shows a over-seven-foot-tall skeleton having been found in one of the mounds. A Putnam was the only person to dig in the mounds. Who's telling the truth, the professor? Or the photograph. In Steelville, Missouri, back in 1933, they found an eight foot tall skeleton. The local newspaper says an ancient Ozark giant was dug up near Steelville, 
Strange discovery made by a boy looking for arrowheads gives this Missouri town an absorbing mystery to ponder. The grizzly find was brought to Dr. R. C. Parker and stretched out in its enormous length in the hallway of his office, where it has since remained the most startling exhibit Steelville has ever had on public view. Three reports of the find were uncovered, including photographs that show less eaten a six-foot-tall man laid out next to this eight-foot-tall skeleton in the doctor's office. The Channel Islands off the coast of California have turned up numerous oversized skeletons. A man described as an amateur archaeologist named Ralph Glidden found several giants while working on Catalina Island. He placed these finds in a museum. The boys in the white lab coat got all poo-pooed that these findings because Glidden didn't document his finds. He just dug them up. Nobody seems to deny that the skeletons, eight feet tall, are real. They're just mad about how he acquired them. Glidden unearthed a collection of a total of 3,781 skeletons on the Channel Islands between 1919 and 1930. He was working for the Hay Foundation of New York when he uncovered a 9-foot, 2-inch skeleton. Now, he also found several that were over 7 feet tall. All the male skeletons averaged about 7 feet tall. One was 7 foot 8 from the top of the head to its ankles. With the feet attached, it would have been taller. The 9-foot, 2-inch tall skeleton was also uncovered. As part of the TV show, Search for the Lost Giants, Jim and Bill Vieira visited Catalina to investigate the reports of giants. They were shown photographs of hundreds of skeletons and skulls, excavated artifacts, and burial items. In Beaver Lake at the Ozark Caves in Arkansas, 1913, a nearly 10-foot-tall skeleton was found, as well as several huge skulls. The New Age magazine from 1913 gives a report from Victor Sch Schaffelmeyer. The cave was eventually flooded after a dam was built in the 1960s. Bill Vieira and Mike Young dove and found a huge shelter cave, which they believe was the site where the skeleton was found. The cave had a stone wall built around the opening, which showed the place had been occupied at one time. In Lompoc Ranch, California, a 12-foot-tall skeleton was found in 1819. The newspaper from back then said, in 1819, an old lady saw a gigantic skeleton dug up by soldiers at Parisma on the Lompoc Ranch. Soldiers digging a pit for a powder magazine in Lompoc Ranch, California, hacked their way through a layer of cemented gravel and found a 12-foot-long sarcophagus. Indians didn't bury their dead like that. The skeleton of a giant man about 12 feet tall was found inside. The grave was surrounded by carved shells, a huge stone axe, two spears, and a thin sheet of porphyry, a purplish mineral with quartz, uh, covering the skeleton. Uh, these were covered with unintelligible symbols. He had a double row of teeth both upper and lower. The soldiers consulted a local tribe of Indians who, after going into a trance, uh, they exclaimed that they were geographically displaced Alawigi Indians from the Ohio Valley area. When the natives began to attach some religious significance to the find, the authorities ordered this skeleton all artifacts secretly reburied. <clears throat> Two 12-foot skeletons were reported in 
Jeffersonville, Kentucky, and Bernard, Missouri. These reports come from the Providence Evening Press, September 13, 1883. A 13-foot skeleton was unearthed in Janesville, Wisconsin, and bones that were estimated to be from a skeleton 14 feet tall in Itawa Mounds. In West Hickory, Pennsylvania, in 1870, they dug up an 18-foot tall skeleton. Uh, this report comes from the Oil City Times about that discovery. The giant was dressed in some kind of body armor. The article said, They exhumed an enormous helmet made of iron, which was covered with rust. Further digging brought to light a sword which measured nine feet in length. The skull held double rows of teeth, both top and bottom. I used to watch Search for Lost Giants back when it was on TV. I also read Jim Vieira in Hugh Newman's book, Giants on the Record. With so many examples of giants being not just a one-off or the imagination of uneducated locals, why is so much effort put forth to pretend that they were not real historical creatures? A seeing as giants were real, could the Cap d'Oie have originally been a real creature? After all, 18-foot-tall giant found here in the North Americas? Why couldn't a 12-foot giant have roamed South America? As for the two heads... If you don't believe people can live with two heads, there are people out there with two heads. One of them is a school teacher. That way she can watch the class while correcting homework at the same time. I always wonder, does she get paid twice? Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, let your friends know. Let your enemies know. Let everybody know that they should be listening to strange things as well. As Tony Merkel from The Confessional says, share the show. We don't care how you share it. Just share it so that others can hopefully learn to like strange things. Until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Coming to the tree, where they strung up a man, who they say he murdered three. Strange things have happened there. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. <laughs>